In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve difficult problems with recursion in JavaScript. But firstly, what is recursion? Recursion is used to solve problems where the solution depends on solutions to smaller problems. And it does this by creating a function that calls itself. So why would you use recursion? Recursion is really useful when there is multiple possible branches. And I'm going to show you an example where we do just that. Before we get started, I have a few tips for using recursion in your programs. Make sure you test your functions. And because we're creating a function that just calls itself, your functions should produce reliable output, making them easy to test. Where applicable, you should use memoization. And I'm going to give you an example of this. And this is going to help you with my third point, And this is to be careful of memory issues. You can get yourself into infinite loops with recursion if you're not careful. And this brings me on to my fourth point, make sure all inputs have a way to exit. And if there is no way to exit for a given input, make sure you handle that early on in your function. So we're going to go through two examples in this video. We're going to create a function called is empty deep. And this is going to check if a object is empty deep down. And by empty, I mean it just doesn't have a value such as a string, number, or Boolean. And then secondly, we're going to do the classic Fibonacci sequence. And I'm going to show you how to use memoization in this recursive function. So I have this test folder here, and inside of the test folder, I have a test for each of the functions that we're going to write. The first one is called is empty deep test. And in here, we have a few cases. So we have this empty object, and this should be true because this is just an empty object. We have this object that has one property called data, but data is empty, so this should also be true. We have a data object here, and data has one property, and this property has true, and so our function should return false. And we have another object here with a data property, and our data has a property called data again, which is an empty array, and so we should return true, and so on. So if I run this test, we should expect it to fail. So you can see here we get seven failures. So our job is to write a function that satisfies all of these test cases. So the first thing we want to do in our function is just return false. So if we return false, we can see that we now get three passing tests. The next thing we want to do is we want to check to see if our property is simply undefined. So I'm going to say if is undefined, and I'm going to use Lodash to help me with write this function data, then return true. So if the data property passed in is undefined, we're just going to return true. Next, we're going to say is empty. Return true. So if we pass in an empty array, for example, we're just going to return true. And I'm just getting the easy cases out of the way first. So the next thing we want to do is to check if we have an object. And if we do, we want to run through each property of that object. And we want to see if that property, it has a value. And if it does, then we can simply return false. So we want to return object.keys data dot every key. And then we're going to call our is empty deep function again. And we're going to pass in data key. So we're almost there. The problem is, is we're not actually checking to see if we have any values. So we're going to come up to the top again, and we're going to say if is string data, then return false. Or is number data or is boolean data. Okay, so all of our tests are passing. Let's have a look at what is going on here. For our first test, we're just gonna pass in an empty object. So data is going to be empty. We're going to get to is empty, and we're going to return true. And so this is the true that we expect here. On our second property, we're going to see data. We're going to come down to is object for data. And then we're going to map through each of the properties. So we see one, we get to our condition at the top here and we're simply going to return false. For a third test, we see data, we're gonna come down to is object and then we're going to pass in data again. 
we're going to get to is empty and we're going to return true. So you can see that by using recursion, we can go off onto multiple branches of logic, making our function much more versatile. There's one little thing we can do to clean up this function, and these conditions here both return true, and so we can remove is empty, and we can say or is empty, and we can remove this block here, and our tests are going to pass just the same. Let's have a look at our Fibonacci sequence. We have a bunch of tests here, so given the input zero, we should expect a result of zero, for one, we should expect a result of one, for two, we should expect a result of one, and so on until we get down to 10 where we should expect a result of 55. And I have one more test that's commented out currently. And this is because without memoization, running our Fibonacci function with 100 iterations is going to be extremely memory intensive and our function will never actually finish executing. So let's implement our function to satisfy these first tests. So I'm going to say if n is less than or equal to one, we're going to return n, and this is our exit clause here. Otherwise, I'm going to simply return bib n minus 1 plus bib n minus 2. And you can see that all of our tests are passing now. So if we comment out these tests, and then we run our Fibonacci function with 100 as the input, you can see that our test is going to hang here for a long time. And that's because we're just running through the Fibonacci function over and over again to calculate the result of 100. Let's exit this test if we can. So to fix this, we can use a technique called memoization. And what memoization is going to allow us to do is if we calculate the result of this function here, we don't need to calculate it again we can simply pass that result on through each call of our fib function. So to do this, we need to provide two arguments now to fib. One is called memo, and we're just going to default this to an empty object. Secondly, we need to ask, do we have n inside of memo? And if we do, we can simply return memo n. So I'm going to say if memo n return memo n. And if we don't, then we need to say memo n is equal to, and we can return memo n. So the next thing we need to do is to make sure every call of fib now gets the new version of memo. And so we can pass this in as the second argument. Now let's try run our test again. And you can see that our function actually runs now, and we can calculate the Fibonacci number of some really complicated numbers. In both of these tests, you can see this one passed in 31 milliseconds and the next one passed in four milliseconds. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure you leave a thumbs up and subscribe to make sure you get notified whenever I release a new video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.